my first firefight was over before I realized I was in it. It literally was over. I hadn't fired a shot. Um, you know, you're you're because you're a sergeant, you're given a position of leadership. You're leading young men who've... I remember when I met my squad, they had more experience. They'd been there, some of them for months, uh, some of them only weeks. But all of a sudden, I'm their sergeant, I'm in charge. Um, I, I told them if, you know, just teach me everything you know and I will lead you. Uh, but I was, I thought, smart enough to at least let them know that, you know, I was, um, they had value because they'd been there. But within a few weeks, uh, I'm their legitimate leader. Um, and I can remember the day I was wounded. I, uh, we, we had spotted the enemy in a valley. I, uh, I was very uh, confident. I was ordered to take my men down to make contact. We, uh, we started down a hillside that was uh, wound up being infested with, uh, with Viet Cong. Uh, we ran into a base camp. They had recently vacated. There were still uh, uh, embers glowing where they'd been warming their rice. Um, we discovered several uh, uh, entrances to um, uh, caves. We were ordered to leave them in place and, and keep moving until we made contact. My, uh, I remember my radio man was, um, he was just 18 years old, uh, moving down that hillside. We, uh, we came across a, 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 an open well. It was literally looked like something out of a Tarzan movie. It was right in the middle of the jungle, some stones around a, a, a well that was uh, literally just an underground spring that was flowing up underneath the that jungle canopy the uh, we had trouble getting past it uh, and we as we swung around a tree to get past it uh, my point man went first and then I went and then my radio man uh, juicer was his nickname and when he uh, he tried to maneuver around the tree he fell into the pool of water and I remember hearing this splash I looked her back and he was uh, he was gone, he was under the water. Um, we drug him out. I remember being so scared and angry with him. Uh, scared because he had the radio on his back and he went underwater. It was, um, and so we, we drug him out. The radio didn't work. I remember getting in his face. I, uh, I literally grabbed his lapels and said, you know, as long as I'm your sergeant, as long as you're carrying our radio, as long as we're in Vietnam, stay behind me and that crap won't happen you know um, we were out in the jungle about to make contact with the enemy and no radio and that's the worst place an infantryman can be because without the radio you can't get help can't get a helicopter you've just got to fight it out and you know we, we had no idea who we were fighting what how big a unit but we knew they were there and so we stumbled further down the hillside. We got to the bottom of the hill just a few meter, meters later. Um, came in upon a clearing. My point man got about halfway across before I stepped out of the jungle and into the clearing. And my point man froze. He turned around and he said, I see something in the weeds. And he asked me what to do. Well, the one thing we were taught, when you see something and you think it's the enemy, fired up and that's what I said fired up he fired one round and his weapon jammed and I thought what else can go wrong today and uh, he's I remember him looking back at me and he's confused and I just yelled get down and I kept I started to move out to where I thought I saw the weeds moving and the direction of his shot had gone and I started shooting just single shots into the moving weeds as I moved out. I got closer. I, I just kind of remember my feeling was the weeds kind of stood up. And all of a sudden, I'm face to face with a soldier from the uh, a Viet Cong. I didn't see his weapon. I just remember seeing his kind of his face and a button on his, a little white button on his black shirt. 
and I, the, my last thought was slipping my weapon into automatic from single shot and firing at that image of that button. I don't remember shooting actually. I'm told later that uh, there were actually three soldiers who stood up uh, and I shot the one in the middle. Um, at the same time they shot me and the bullets that hit me, I got hit three times. The bullets that went through me um, also hit my radio man. I didn't expect my radio man to be behind me. We should have been spaced further apart because the radio didn't work anymore. So he wasn't functionally my radio man. He, we should have maintained. But I forgot to tell him that. I, and he died because of that. Um, the uh, young, it got confusing all of a sudden. I remember um, I was, um, I spun around and fell face first in the dirt. I remember saying, uh, I'm sorry, Wendy. Excuse me, she was my uh, five month old daughter. I, uh, I thought I was dead. And as I fell to the ground, I, uh, it was kind of confusing because I, my, I, I didn't reach out. I, my hands didn't work. What I didn't know was I'd been shot in the head and the shoulder and the right hand. So that side didn't work and the other side didn't work because it was, I was, I'd become paralyzed. Um, I would later find out that that paralysis was temporary. It, um, a year later I was fine. I just have some, some numbness, but I can, I can move everything. But that moment I couldn't work my hands. So I fell flat on my face and uh, I thought I was dead. And I was, um, the strangest thing happened to me. I, I saw this image. Uh, it was, uh, it was a little quote that my sixth grade coach had drilled into my head. It was, winners never quit, quitters never win. And I remember thinking, that's a strange thing to see when you die. And then I realized maybe I'm not dead. And so I tried to breathe. I said, well, I'll try to not quit breathing. And I breathed in the dirtiest, nastiest taste I've ever had. It was that crappy ground that we we fought and died in. Uh, it was just had a smell and taste to it. That's still a bitter taste in my mouth. But I coughed and then I uh, turned my head to the side and I, I breathed again. And next thing I know, um, one of the skinniest little soldiers I ever knew from South Carolina, his name was George Stevens, blonde hair. And uh, he grabbed me and flipped me over and I saw him and he, he leaned me up against a little mound of dirt. The, the clearing we were in was actually a, a graveyard. They use mounds of dirt to bury their, uh, their dead instead of burying them deep. And uh, I, my, my limbs weren't working right. One, I, my left arm was just, it was just flopping around. It was on its own. I couldn't stop it. I couldn't control it. I remember George saying, Sarge, get your arm down. You're going to get it shot. And then uh, I said, I can't control it. And so he held it down. And then he, uh, I felt this bullet hit me in the head and I, I thought it blew the top of my head off. Um, and so I, I kept asking him, can you see my brain? Can you see my brain? And finally he said, he said, Sarge, you didn't have any brains before you got shot. You don't have any now either. And I, I did what you're trying not to do and that's laugh. Um, I, uh, George uh, took my, uh, my bandage off of my waist and we all carried a, a compressed bandage for if you ever got really hurt, that was what you used. 
So he took mine off and patched my head. And then he did something I... I'll never forget. He took his own bandage right in the middle of that fight. And that bandage was important because it, it was your life, kind of like, it was your lifeline. It, metaphorically, it was a lifeline. Um, but he used his bandage to then bandage my shoulder. And I, I had felt no pain until then. And then he, he, when he bandaged my shoulder, he grabbed my hand and, and that hurt. I looked down and I realized I'd had a, my hand was shattered. It would, he grabbed the bones were sticking out and he grabbed it and it hurt. So I looked at it. And when I looked, that's the first time I saw my radio man. Joe had died instantly. They, uh, they called in medevac and they put Joe's body on the helicopter and, and I, I climbed in and uh, I remember uh, they were tending to Joe, the medics on the helicopter were, and uh, I was just looking out the door of the helicopter. All of a sudden I felt somebody grab me from behind and I had started to fall out of the helicopter just looking at the ground. I, um, I wasn't paying much attention, I guess, because of my head wound. And the, uh, the medic grabbed me and pulled me back in and threw me on the floor and yelled at me. And uh, he said, well, you've lived this long, it's not, you don't want to die now. And uh, flew me back to the, uh, the nearest base and uh, So I was coming in, we, I was looking up and I saw the base and the helicopter pad and there was a burning helicopter on it. It was upside down. And I thought, what the hell? And I thought the base was being overrun. What I didn't know was uh, our colonel, Colonel J.J. Clark, a battalion commander had been up above us in a helicopter. And when we got in our little dust up, he, uh, he ordered his helicopter down and he was literally shooting at the guys that were shooting at me uh, with his pistol. He was a good man. When we, uh, we got out of the helicopter, I, uh, I was carried into a, uh, a sandbagged area. Uh, it was a, uh, a mesh unit. And uh, they set me on this wooden post. They took my litter and set the, right on the post. And, and I saw this, there was a kid, a young soldier crying in the corner, squatted down crying. I didn't know what that was about. And then I saw a doctor and I looked up at him and he's all wearing like an apron and it's got blood all over it. I'll never forget his first words, he said, I hope you do better than the colonel did. He just died on this bed. I didn't know anything about that. I just met the colonel a few weeks before. He had come out to visit our platoon out in the field, and when he, uh, when I brought his helicopter down, uh, and pulled security as he's going up to meet the rest of the platoon, he, he noticed I was uh, I was married. He saw a wedding ring. He said, Sergeant, are you married? Well, right away I took off my helmet. I said, yes, sir. And I showed him a picture of my, my daughter and my wife. And uh, so he took off his helmet. And that's where soldiers keep stuff. And he showed me a picture. I'll never forget his wife and those step stair daughters. They all had blonde hair. I think there were three daughters and a wife. It might have been four daughters. They were, uh, that was how I met last time I talked to J.J. Clark. But I, uh, I, I was, I was not that badly wounded. I, I, uh, they took me into surgery and just, you know, did, preliminary things that they do and 
um, I uh, I woke up in a uh, in a ward with uh, lots of people around me in the beds. Remember, there was a little Vietnamese boy in the bed next to me. He didn't have any arms or legs. He had uh, tried to pick up something in the on the path, and it was a mine. I remember. I met a young young pilot named Dave Hunter. He was uh, he had been the pilot for my colonel. They'd been shot up pretty bad. The colonel was shot when he came down and was shooting the enemy. He had uh, they opened up on him with a machine gun and hit the pilot, the co-pilot, and the colonel and the door gunner. The colonel was killed. The others all lived, but uh, Dave Hunter was a co-pilot. He had flown that um, that burning helicopter that I saw. He had flown it back um, with no instruments. It was all malfunctioning every which way. He held the helicopter down while they got everybody else off, and then he had literally had to. The helicopter wouldn't slow down. The rotor just kept turning, so he had to unbuckle and unass the aircraft in the right direction so that it didn't flip over on him. But he got out of there and uh, with just a slight wound of his hand. Uh, Dave Hunter visited me about six months later. I was still in the hospital in the, in the United States. He had brought his bo brother's body back. And uh, he came by the hospital to say hello. A decent thing to do, and he was on his way back to Vietnam. Six months later, I was still in the same hospital, and I got a call from the uh, uh, transition unit, wherever they take. Uh, there's, um, when soldiers that are wounded have been moved from one base to another, they uh, at Scott Air Force Base in St. Clair County, they uh, I got a call from that that unit. They had a patient that was going to be there overnight and wanted to talk to me. And I came over to see him. His name was Dave Hunter. When Dave had gone back to Vietnam, he was promoted to captain. And he took his crew up for a celebration flight. And just as he reached about 3,000 feet, the rotor broke. He lost power to the aircraft. Crash landed. Everybody made it out safely except for Dave and he was paralyzed from the waist down. He had been uh, with me in Quinh Yan, Vietnam, the morning that I woke up after my surgery. He had been with me when he brought his brother's body back. And here we were together now, a year later. A lot of things went wrong in that war. Uh, but I always felt like I was fortunate because I, uh, I came back well, I, from Vietnam. I went to Japan. Um, in Japan, I wasn't doing so well. And I guess I didn't really appreciate the head wound I had, uh, but I had to go through surgery on my brain uh, in uh, Japan, and they quite literally saved my life. It's funny, the things you remember. Uh, I remember waking up and uh, in that hospital and after having surgery and the sergeant was in charge, or in charge of my bed. He was so happy. He said, uh, boy, I'm glad to see you. We." This was several days later. I, I didn't know what happened, but I, he said, we didn't think we were going to make it. <laughs> and all I could say to him was, I, I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and uh, so he got me a pan to go to the bathroom. And I guess I hadn't gone in a while. And he was, <laughs> he was so excited. 
<laughs> I filled that pan up, and he, uh, I guess not very good for publication, but he was just little things that uh, brought some joy to that sergeant and made me laugh too, I guess. The, uh, I was in a, a ward full of head injuries. There were men that I watched a young captain get his purple heart and silver star pinned on his gown. They took him to surgery later that day and he never came back. He, he didn't make it. We, uh, there were lots of very terrible injuries. I always wonder what happened to all those guys. I hope they, hope they all made it. When, how long did it take you to recover from your, your wounds? Uh, really, I, I was on my feet in a couple of months, but I was still under therapy. I had multiple surgeries, and so they would operate on me, and, and I'd be in the bed for a day or two, and. I, I had my last surgery about uh, 13 months, 14 months after after I was wounded, and then uh, they, uh, the army let me go um, about 18 months altogether of uh, recovery time, and, and they uh, I remember they said, "Do you want to stay in, or do you want to retire?" And I said, well, if I stay in, will you, can I go back to Vietnam? And they said, no, no, you're, Sergeant, your, your days are over for fighting. I didn't like that. As irrational as it sounds, you want to go back. I still want to go back. I, I always felt as I had failed, and uh, one of the reasons I knew I'd failed is that Joe was dead. Uh, he was dead because I, because he followed me, and uh, I remember when I was getting out of the army, I, I asked about my radio man, because I really did, I didn't know his name, I just know his. Excuse me, juicer. And uh, I looked up the people who were killed the day I was wounded. Um, I couldn't find any, nothing that sounded like juicer. So I asked the army. This guy was in my squad. Can you tell me who he was? And I remember them saying, um, "Sarge, you you got shot in the head. Maybe you don't know what you're talking about because that didn't. We don't think that happened." And uh, I knew it happened. Um, so I thought I was maybe crazy. And uh, so I shut up about it. I shut up about it for a long time. And finally I asked a few questions. And the Vietnam Memorial was built a couple years later, 10 years later maybe. And I never went out to see it. I couldn't go, but I, but I contacted the, the people who ran the, the wall, and uh, there's a foundation. I told them my, my query about my soldier that, was, that died. And they said, well, let us, let us look into it. And I remember a young lady whose name was Corky called me once, and she called my office, and I, uh, I remember talking to her and she said, I, uh, I think I found somebody that you want to know about. And uh, she said, there was a soldier killed with you that day. And his, uh, his name was Joseph Michael Giusta, G-I-U-S-T-A. I guess that's why we called him Juicer. Uh, she 
Phillips said he enlisted in uh, from uh, Midland, Michigan. And I, um, I dropped the phone. <laughs> I remember dropping the phone when she said his name. And I just started crying. Because this, this person now had a name. And I, uh, I cried. And a few minutes later, I picked up the phone. And before I hung it up, I said hello. And she was still there. She said, I knew you'd do that. So she just held on. She had listened to me cry. That night I went home and I I called, uh, I knew the area code for Detroit. I have family there. and So I called that area code, asked for an operator. And uh, said, I'm looking for the last name of Justa, G-I-U-S-T-A. She said, we have no listings. That She said, but we have some new area codes around the rest of the state. She could hear the disappointment in my voice. And she said, in the rest of the state, we do have one listing for Justa. Peggy Justa. She gave me the number. And I called that number. Gave her my name. Lady answered the phone. I said, my name is Ron Stevens. And uh, when I was in Vietnam, I lost a radio man. His name was Joseph Michael Justa. I wonder if you know that name. She started to cry. She said, that's my brother. Peggy was his only living relative. And for years I had refused to look for him because I thought I was crazy because the army had said he didn't exist. Well, the, uh, if I'd have looked for him all those years, Peggy had gotten married divorced, married again, and divorced. But just the previous year, she was so proud because for the first time in her life, she had changed her name back to Justa, and for the first time in her life, had her name in the phone book as Peggy Justa. Joe's parents had died. Peggy was his only living relative. And uh, so if I'd have looked for her, I would never have found her. So I think God has a way of taking care of old soldiers like me. And so when I did look, he was, she was there. I asked if I could come and see her. I wanted to tell her about my part in her brother's death. So I went to see her, and it was a very emotional day. And I told her my version of how I told Joe to stay behind me. But I didn't want him to stay behind me when I went out. And how I was responsible for her brother's death. And uh, she cried a little and thought about what I said. And then she said the bravest words I think I've ever heard. She lost her only brother. And she said, Ron, did it occur to you that Joe was just as brave as you are, as you were? And it was as if she lifted the weight of the world off of my shoulders. And, uh, and that's what Joe did that day. He knew what he was doing. He followed me because we were confronting the enemy and that's what soldiers do and so we uh, Peggy and I became friends and and I was able to put a lot of the war behind me then and uh, I was able then to talk more about it and that's why I'm participating today because um, the Joseph Michael Justus of the war deserved to be remembered for the brave young men they were.